So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today with us for the fifth session of our spring school garden leadership training series. Hi ho, hi ho, it's off to work we go. And today we'll be hosting a panel on careers in agriculture with the goal of providing teachers a glimpse into the many career paths that are possible in food systems and agriculture. And we hope that you'll walk away from this experience more informed and excited about Florida agriculture and able to answer questions from your students as they approach graduation and enter the working world. My name is Tiffany Torres and I am the State School Garden Specialist with Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and I'll be facilitating today along with Becky Spahn-Holtz and Jen Morgenthal. We have some great guest speakers here with us today who are eager to share with you. So let's get started. And one of our goals, as you know by now, with this series is to increase networking across the state between educators and school garden leaders. So if you haven't already, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box. You can include your name, your organization, and your school that you're affiliated with, your county, and maybe share what you wanted to be when you were a kid. Uh, you can also note that you can rename yourself and include your pronouns in Zoom by clicking the three dots next to your video box. And as you're getting to know one another, I'm gonna just touch on a quick Zoom housekeeping. So it is best to view our presentations today in the side-by-side -side speaker view, which you can find at the top right of your screen. And you'll notice too, that once you are in side-by-side -side speaker view, that there's a vertical bar down the middle separating the speaker and the pre presentation. You can toggle that left and right to make the presentation or the speaker bigger as you go. Uh, please also note that we'll be using the reactions feature as, as we do our Q&A today. So that can be found at the bottom of your screen. And you can click participants to see everyone who's here with us on our panel today and then use the chat as you're willing. Please continue to mute your audio and video as we go so that it is clear in the recording who's speaking. And all closed captioning will be available in our YouTube recordings. So before I introduce our guest speakers, I wanna take a moment to ground us in what this training series is all about and who the experts are that are here to help you. This webinar series is brought to you by Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and the University of Florida IFAS Extension Family Nutrition Program. All webinars will be recorded for future viewing and CEUs are available upon request. So please mark your calendars if you haven't already. We have one more session this spring and we hope to join you again next fall. So our next session will be on April 20th, NPK Alphabet Soup Navigating Fertilizers. And we'll have some exciting youth presenters at that event. Uh, you can view all of our past recordings on our YouTube channel, register for the future one on our Eventbrite. And by registering, please remember you also get access to handouts and resources in our shared Google Drive folder after each session concludes. So this webinar series is designed for Florida school garden leaders of all levels to build gardening confidence, foster collaboration among leaders, strengthen garden programs for long-term success. And we do this by incorporating three core elements into each of our sessions, gardening knowledge, curriculum connections, and community organizing strategies. This session's a little bit different in that we're doing a panel style, so we won't focus too much on the technical aspects of things, but if you have any questions related to the content of the speakers, their contact information will be provided to you. And both Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and the Family Nutrition Program are here to support you every step of the way. Please reach out directly to us if you'd like additional consultation services. A little bit more about Florida Agriculture in the Classroom. We are a statewide nonprofit that is funded through the specialty license plate known as Ag Tag that you see there on the left. We offer a variety of educational resources that are free on our website, including school garden curriculum, activity newspapers, and agricultural themed lessons. We also offer farm to school programming, such as the annual agricultural literacy day, virtual farm field trips, which our first will be on May 25th. So registration for that is forthcoming on our website. Workshops and trainings, both virtual and in person and school garden consultation. We also offer a variety of grants and awards. All of our grants are currently closed, but please check back for future school season. And you can see all of our contact information there on the right if you'd like to follow up with us. And our second partner in the series is the University of Florida IFAS Extension Family Nutrition Program, or FNP. 
FMT provides SNAP education in Florida throughout 40 counties and has been providing that free nutrition education since 1996. FMP helps limited resource families in Florida access more nutritious food choices on a budget and adopt healthier eating and physical activity habits to reduce the risk of obesity and chronic disease. And so now I'd like to introduce you to our panelists today that are here to share a little bit about what they do in agriculture. So I will introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking. Each of them will be speaking for 10 minutes. And first we have Marshall Sewell. Marshall is the US Open Field Strategic Accounts and Partnerships Manager with Bayer Crop Science. We also have Tori, Tori Rumenick, who is the Commodity Services and Supply Chain Manager with Florida Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Association. And we have farmers, Kip Ritchie and Angelique Taylor, who are the business owners of Smarter by Nature up in Tallahassee, Florida. We have Lola Collins, who is a process engineer with TrueLeave. And we have Melanie Mason, food recovery specialist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And all of the question and answer will be facilitated by Florida Ag in the classroom today. So just a note on the question and answer, each guest speaker will have about five to seven minutes to share about their profession and what they do in, in agriculture in Florida. And then we will follow that with three to five minutes of Q&A from the audience. We want this to be as interactive as possible. So to ask a question verbally, you can use the raise hand feature at the bottom of Zoom. And when we see that your hand is raised, then we will call on you and you can unmute yourself and speak directly to the presenter. Or if you choose not to uh, ask your question verbally, you can also ask non-verbally by using the chat box and we'll moderate that as well. And some of the speakers will be staying on a little bit after 4.30 if you wanna to continue to network with them too. So before I hand it over to Marshall, I wanted to zoom out a little bit and give you the bigger picture for why agriculture and why careers in Florida. Florida is one of the top agricultural states in the country, often ranking second and third to Texas and California. And according to the Florida Department of Agriculture, as of 2021, Florida currently has 9.7 million acres in agricultural production. With a climate that's ideal for growing and a wide variety of produce and livestock, Florida produces more than 300 commodities. Um, Florida ranks first in the US in value of production of cucumbers, grapefruit, oranges, squash, sugarcane, fresh market snap beans, and fresh market tomatoes. And often when I'm presenting to kids about agriculture, I'd like to ask them how many farms they think there are in the state. And they usually answer something very, very small or very, very large. Uh, but the answer is actually there are 47,400 ag operations in Florida as of 2021. And that contributes to more than 7.6 billion to the state's economy. But when we zoom out and we think about the food system at large, Production, as I just mentioned, is only one small piece. So you can see from this graphic here on the right, created by the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, there are many sectors that work together to create functioning systems, food, functioning food systems at the local and the regional and the state and national scales. And what I love about this graphic is that it also includes the support system, the gray bar that you can see around the middle there, such as government agencies, nonprofits, trade associations, and so on. So some of our presenters here today work in the production aspect of agriculture, like our farmers, and others work in aspects like processing, marketing, education, and advocacy. There's a variety of career paths in agriculture and everyone has a part to play. So with that, I will hand it over to Marshall who will share more about his work with Bayer. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. And Tiffany, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, before I even get started talking about my background, uh, I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody who's participating on the call. I think um, generally speaking within the farming community or the ag industry, a lot of times the statistic that we use is the average consumer is at least two generations removed from production or from, from the farm level. And so um, making sure that general consumers and people understand the food system and what goes into getting food from the farm to the actual plate is is a very big topic and uh, so thank you all for the work you're doing to advocate for agriculture and also to provide these experiences that allow uh, students or individuals to be immersed in agriculture so thank you for that 
Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, I, I don't have much in terms of a presentation. I, I just made this slide real quick. But uh, yes, my name is Marshall Sewell and I work for Bayer Crop Science. And uh, I'm now serving as a U.S. Open Field Strategic Accounts Manager. Um, my background is actually in production at the farm level. I grew up on my family's uh, fifth generation farm operation in Plant City, Florida, and we primarily raised strawberries and mixed vegetables. Uh, whenever I was finishing up high school and, and deciding on going to college, I knew that I either wanted to continue farming with my family or I wanted to find an opportunity to work in a role in which I could continue serving farmers and, and helping out farmers and the ag industry. Um, so I decided to go to the University of Florida, and at the time I studied food and resource economics. Um, so basically, I, I focused on agribusiness management. And I, again, I had the intention of most likely coming back home and working for my family's farm operation. But towards the end of my college career, I got the opportunity to uh, take on an internship with, at the time, Feminist Vegetable Seed, uh, which was owned by Monsanto Company, and I got to uh, intern as a field sales representative. Um, that turned into the chance to take on a full-scale career as a sales representative. So I have actually been serving as a sales representative for Seminus Vegetable Seed for seven to eight years at this point, um, going on eight years, and I've had the chance to work with multiple growers up and down the eastern United States uh, in various crops such as bell peppers, watermelons, tomatoes, and things like that. Um, essentially what our company has done is uh, focus on the research and development and the breeding of new varieties and developing new genetics that ultimately will help growers be more productive and more efficient in having crops that are going to produce enough food to, again, get to the plate or to the consumer. Um, with the recent acquisition of our vegetable seed company by Bayer, that's brought me to my new opportunity, which is serving as the Open Field Strategic Accounts Manager. Um, I think one of the main topics that Tiffany wanted me to address on this particular call is a lot of people automatically think of Bayer. Uh, Bayer is just a pharmaceutical company. You know, Bayer makes aspirin or Ma Bayer makes over-the-counter uh, type medicines and things. Uh, but Bayer actually has for quite a while had a significant crop science division um, and has been very involved in the ag industry. But uh, with the recent acquisition of our vegetable company with Seminus, um, Bayer has seen the opportunity to kind of reevaluate the, the lens that they're looking at human health with. So whereas in the past we've looked at human health as more a reactive concept, something where when you're sick or you have issues and things like that, you take medicine, uh, being involved in the food industry or in the fruit and vegetable uh, piece of the industry allows you to kind of look at human health and performance from a nutrition standpoint as well and look at it through more of a proactive lens. So we're really excited about sort of the integration of Bayer and, and some of the entities that it has recently acquired, uh, with one of those being the vegetable division for whom I work. Um, we're continuing to work in the research and development of new, new genetics to bring more value to our growers and ultimately bring higher quality, um, more nutritious products to general consumers. Um, within my current role, I actually, I'm covering the entire U.S. for our open field production. So that's anything that's not in greenhouses or anything like that. It's, it's as it says, uh, food produced in the open field. I am going to be working with, or, or currently am working with, some of our larger uh, producer accounts uh, the ones that have uh, typically a significant retail presence, so the brand names that you would see on fruits and vegetables at your local supermarket or grocery store. I'll also be working with the supermarkets themselves, and ultimately in this role, uh, being part of Bayer Crop Sciences' strategic segment, we're wanting to get a better, more broader understanding of what's taking place at the consumer level so that we can better be, needi be meeting the needs of those consumers and of our customers. Uh, we want to better understand the trends that are impacting the retail level uh, that is then driving what our growers are producing. We want to be able to offer the most complete packages to our growers to help them, again, produce the highest quality product in the most efficient manager, uh, manner while continuing to be sustainable and environmentally friendly. So that's ultimately the goal. Uh, with that, um, Tiffany, if, if there's any questions at all, I'd be more than happy to discuss what we're doing at Bear or um, whatever you'd like me to, to address.
Hey guys, it's Jen. So I'm going to go ahead and moderate this um, segment of our Q&A. So Marshall, what kinds of packages do you offer to your growers? So historically, whenever seed companies were really thinking about developing genetics or developing products, we were really just trying to identify um, yield. We were trying to figure out what is going to help a grower produce the most or, or help them um, just maximize their total production. That has evolved so much um, just throughout time and, and with the hybridization of crops and things like that. Um, we are looking at so many different factors, such as um, which ones are going to show a little more tolerance uh, to cold weather or to heat or maybe not need as much in terms of water or all different ways and manners of being more efficient. But the big thing that we're really focusing on right now and that we're hearing from retailers and from consumers is there's a big focus that needs to be placed on nutrition content. Um, just trying to find, uh, just trying to find products that are going to produce fruit or produce vegetables that are going to be higher in nutrition or higher in nutrient content. Um, and again, it goes back to that human health and nutrition piece. Uh, just trying to ensure that we're getting good quality foods into the food system um, for for our consumers. Thank you. So do any of the attendees have a question? If you want to raise your hand, um, we can let you guys pick up the mic if anybody has a question for Marshall. So Marshall, I have a question as far as um, educating our children uh, that are in school systems. Why do you think it is important for us to place um, that at the forefront? Um, when we're talking about the agriculture industry, like student growth equaling industry growth? I really think that ultimately um, advocacy in general is huge for our industry. And um, a conversation that continues to come up is, is where can you make a huge impact? Well, that's getting people uh, to understand what goes on within the industry or within food production at the earliest age possible. Um, so I think that by tar focusing on students and school systems and things like that, you are essentially helping students to better understand the work, the opportunities, all the things that go into the, the food that is on their plate earlier on. Um, they can go through the rest of their lives with that general knowledge or with that general understanding. Um, you know, right now we are at a point within the agricultural industry where there's so many misconceptions uh, or, or the spread of misinformation about what goes into production of our food, uh, production of our fiber, and just all those natural resources related conversations. And I think that now it is more pertinent than probably ever that we need to, we as agriculturalists need to be making sure to share our narrative rather than allowing other people to spread that for us. So I think that trying to make sure that accurate information, accurate depictions are being portrayed earlier on is, is very vital. And so I think that one manner and one manner to do that is, as we just said, by trying to introduce this at earlier ages, such as through the school system. Awesome. So a couple more questions. We got about two minutes left, but what are the goals for improvement in nutrition related uh, to the crops and what are the crops you often work with? So um, I, I'll share my opinion. Um, in, in my opinion, I think it's about finding a balance because ultimately, from a production standpoint, you have to have agronomic traits. You have it, it's a business. At the end of the day, from a farm standpoint, you have to be able to produce enough to to stay in business. But on the flip side of that, within our company, as we're going through the process of identifying traits or genetics or trying to identify new varieties that will work in the open field, um, we're also taking the time to do food science related projects, do sensory studies and sensory panels and things like that, and better understand flavor profiles, taste panels, nutritional content and things like that. Um, I, I hope that kind of in general touches on your answer, but I, I think ultimately it's finding a balance between agronomic traits and properties while also really digging deeper into nutritional panels, nutritional content of our products as well. Awesome. Thank you. And then we have one more question, um, and I'm assuming this is what is meant, but does Bayer or any of those umbrella companies underneath it have any kind of free seed programs for um, educators or schools? 
that's something that I'll have to look into because in the past it's it's always sort of been a one off um, type thing. Whenever somebody needed something, we would get requests at our main office, and then they would sort of be delegated from there. But if uh, if you give me some time, I can try to reach out to somebody in our main office and see if we have sort of an education system program where we can provide um, provide seed for trialing or uh, school based experiments, things like that. Awesome. And we got about 30 seconds left. So this is a quick one. But do you guys offer any kind of virtual tours of any facilities? Um, for students and for school systems, not that I'm aware of, uh, not that we not that I think we would be opposed to it, but that's a little outside of my, I guess, jurisdiction. But um, I could I could check on that. OK, awesome. I'll follow up with you and see if we can get those answers out to our attendees. So thank you so much, Marshall, for your time here. And we appreciate the info that you've given us. Um, so I'm going to go no ahead problem. and pass it on to Tori with the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association. Hey, all right, Jen, thank you. Um, there we go. Perfect. Thanks. Jen, are you advancing? Yes, we okay, will perfect. advance. Cool. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, like Jen just said, my name is Tori Rumenick. I work with the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association. My official title is Commodity Services and Supply Chain Manager. Um, Jen, you can go ahead. Just wanted to give a quick introduction um, to who FFBA is before I talk about what I do specifically. So um, in that chart that Tiffany showed, you kind of have those gray areas around the outside of where you, know, you have producers and, and people who have inputs into the agricultural system. And in that band on the outside, there's advocacy, there's association groups, um, and that's where FFBA would fall. So we're basically a full service specialty crop organization. We've been around since 1943. Um, and our, basically our mission is to enhance the business and competitive environment for producing all types of fruits, vegetables, and a lot of other crops in the state of Florida. So what does that mean? Um, a lot of it means that we represent grower interests um, before state and federal regulatory agencies. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. We provide assistance in securing farm labor, um, providing access to pesticide labels, water management issues, food safety guidance. Um, we can counsel growers on media relations. We have these growers exchanges, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second, but really anything that our umbrella is anything that our members need. So if it's a board member or just a, a, a regular member of the association, if they have a need, um, they know that we're the first call. And if we don't have the answer, we know who has the answer. We've got a full team. I'm sitting in my office here, but if you go up and down the hall for me, um, just experts on every part of their um, segment of the agricultural business, specifically um, focused on specialty crops. Go ahead, Jen. So what do I do? Um, I just thought maybe a little background first would help. So I got my master's in food and resource economics at UF. So go Gators and Marshall um, is also a fellow FRE grad. I got my bachelor's in economics and public relations from Florida State. So go Knowles. Um, I, if they're not playing each other, I can, I can root for both. But on Thanksgiving weekend, I'm a Seminole through and through. So that's kind of hard to be in the ag um, industry sometimes. My first job out of my master's degree was in agricultural business consulting. Um, I worked basically mer mergers and acquisitions. Um, I, for all these big ag companies, worked on some cattle stuff, some um, biological studies. So kind of a huge overview of all things ag. Now my focus here at FFBA, thankfully, is specialty crop agriculture in Florida. So I think of my job kind of in two silos and then this anything else bucket. So the first bucket is commodity services, which I work with our Sunshine Sweet Corn Farmers of Florida, um, and then the Florida Vegetable Exchange. Um, I'll talk more in a minute about Sunshine Sweet Corn. Um, the second bucket is supply chain management. So within this bucket, I, we do research and advocacy for growers on transportation and all other supply chain issues. So for instance, um, when I first started here, we were petitioning um, a federal agency for some leading at sea on truck driver um, rest times. Um, we were polling members to help uh, the Florida Department of Transportation decide on new weight waivers. Um, a lot of this part of my job has required just learning kind of on the job of writing for um, government policy documents. Um, 
and so we do everything else under the sun. So in this anything else bucket is kind of driven by our membership. So there's, uh, we had a coronavirus food assistance program this year um, that thankfully was put in place by USDA to help our growers. So that's, I felt fielded questions for that. I helped make connections there. There's food safety questions. They'll get directed to me or my boss. Um, quick turn data requests from USDA or, or, or the university um, and really anything else that comes up day to day. This part of my job is one of my favorites because um, I'm not an economist by trade. I, I obviously have studied it, um, love economics, but I use those skills that I learned in that degree every single day um, in this job. So go ahead, Jen. Um, you can go one more. Thanks. I wanted to spend, I know we're tight on time, but um, give you an introduction to what the Sunshine Sweet Corn Farmers of Florida are. Um, just because this is during March through May. So right now, this is what I spend 70 to 80% of my time on. Um, I act as executive director for this group. Um, this chart you're seeing, this is actually outdated. We had some changes, but we're made up of a group of growers and a group of shippers. So the growers grow the crop and then the shippers are the ones that are selling, marketing, and then shipping the crop to um, retail stores or food service or wherever it's going. Sweet corn, it's normally going to um, retail. And I basically, while they're growing and selling, I'm running this Sunshine Sweet Corn business that's marketed under the Sunshine Sweet Corn label. Go ahead, Jen. Um, just to quickly touch on what we do. So we help, we, we price, we set a floor price so that our um, sweet corn price during the season never drops below um, a certain price. I handle a lot of the marketing with a partnership between Fresh from Florida um, and us. We have a variety selection committee that basically makes sure that all of our um, varieties that are being grown are quality varieties. And then we, I do data collection. So while I'm handling the marketing and setting up promotions with retail, I'm also collecting data day to day to help our, our group understand um, kind of what the market looks like and that helps our, our handlers. So Jen, if you'll quickly go to the next two, just show real quick. These are gonna be um, some of the marketing um, things that we've put together with Fresh from Florida. So you can go to the next one. So these, we contacted Fresh from Florida, said, hey, we wanna work with XYZ retailer. We give the retailer some money and they, they come up with these awesome um, promotional materials. Um, and it helps basically just move sweet corn when we have a lot of volume in March through May. Um, so that's what I've got. I just wanted to give a kind of an overview of what I do and then give some time to talk. Um, awesome. And this was just in case people had questions about pricing because oh. sometimes I get that question. <laughs> okay, awesome. So anybody have any questions for Tori? You can either raise your hand or put it in the chat box and we can get those answered. So why did you decide to get into the ag industry? That's a good question. So um, again, background, not in ag. I, um, my family has a peanut and cotton farm up in South Georgia, and I always loved being there. But I was actually on a run at the University of Florida um, visiting my now husband and ran into the sign of the Food and Resource Economics Program and said, I love economics and I love food. So what is this program all about? And ended up in that program um, and it kind of fell in my lap, but um, I wouldn't have it any other way. I love this industry. I love the people we work for. They're truly um, some of the best people in the whole world. So I'm glad I'm here. So with the growers that you work with, um, what are some of the issues you foresee them facing now and possibly in the future? Yeah, so I mean, COVID obviously changed things, right? So. Um, there's some changing in merchandising. There's a lot more focus on online sales. So that's one. Um, when food service kind of just stopped throughout the country, that was an issue. Um, thankfully, that's coming back and hopefully um, it won't be an issue again. But that's one that we've been, been working on. Labor is always an issue for our growers. I would say most growers would tell you getting labor um, is number one because when we grow fruits and veg in the state, the majority of that is going to be hand harvested and you have to have people to harvest it. So always a big one. 
Awesome. So thank you, Tori. I think that's rounding out our, our 10 minute mark. Um, we appreciate you being here. And if we get any other questions, we'll make sure to jot those down and um, get them to you. But um, so, oh, last question. Selena says, I'm thinking you'll get into this next, but what are the exchanges? Very quickly. So exchanges are just groups of growers. If you think of, say, like a co-op, it's just a bunch of growers that can get together and they they help each other um, with marketing. So under the Sunshine Sweet Corn logo um, for the a lot of these aren't in um operation anymore, but the Florida Veg Exchange is a lot of leafy veg growers where if they have, a, say, an outbreak of E. coli out west, this group gets together in Florida to make sure that we're putting the message out that Florida vegetables are safe. Oh, and Peter, we got another question really quick. Any free seeds um, from you guys that you guys offer? We get that I don't question have a lot, any, so it's a good yeah. one. I was going to say, I don't have any seeds. If I, if I come across any, I'll obviously I'll get in touch with Becky and Tiffany and, and Jen and get them out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tori. Thanks, Jen. All right. Let's go ahead and move into our next speakers, Kip and Angelique with Smarter by Nature. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to meet you uh, and be here today. My name is Angelique. And I'm Kit. And we are the co-owners and small-scale farmers of Smarter by Nature. So we began our journey um, around 2014 was when we were initially sparked to get into the agriculture um, field from a trip to New York, which was the People's Climate March. And it was there that we realized that we share a common mission with millions of people around the world who wanted to take action about doing, uh, getting involved in real solutions. So we came back from that trip really invigorated. And that is when we started Smarter by Nature. Our mission is to facilitate sustainable relationships between people and the natural environment. And we do that by providing fresh food and education to our local and also our online community. We go to the next slide. So we farm on borrowed land. We begin in an urban setting and Last year, we started farming on a rural piece of land in Quincy, Florida. The total acre acreage is five, and right now we're currently cultivating one acre. And we grow uh, seasonal, annual, uh, perennial uh, fruit trees, uh, annual vegetables, herbs, and flowers, and we provide that to our local market. Um, since we started, we've grown over 500 pounds of uh, fresh produce for our local market. And um, we mainly supply the Frenchtown Farmers Market in our uh, Tallahassee area, as well as Red Hills Online, which is an online market for people to purchase fresh produce. And then, yeah. So one thing that uh, I guess makes us a little bit different in our farming practices is we try to practice regenerative agriculture using no-till methods and also incorporating permaculture principles as well as natural farming principles. So we really care about the health of our soil and trying to sequester carbon by growing healthy plants and just limit our use of synthetic fertilizers and also trying to keep the soil intact to increase our diversity. And pretty much we care a lot about what goes into the ground and we care about the process of growing food. So not just growing, not we not not just giving food to the people, but make sure we're taking care of the earth in the process. So we're ethics-based business and we like to balance these sustainable practices and include them in our production. 
I think you could go to the next slide. So when we began our business, we thought of three different criteria that we wanted to uh, envision ourselves in. And the first is sustenance. We wanted to provide fresh produce to our community because we realized that we lived in a food desert. We currently live on the south side of Tallahassee and that's where we began. Um, we're also, we also grew in the French town area, and that is where the farmer's market is. So we wanted to address the food insecurity in that area. As we grew and connected with our community, we realized that we needed to provide education because not everyone knows about how to get fresh food or um, how to grow it. So we wanted to provide education and we do that through a number of ways. One is volunteering on our farm. We also make educational videos um, that we post on YouTube and our other social medias. And then we also wanted to make sure that stewardship was a core factor of our business because when we share how to grow food, we also want to share our ethics of taking care of the earth. There are many aspects of agriculture that a young person can choose from and these three are the ones that we focus on. And you can go to the next slide. So here we just wanted to address some questions about um, things that young farmers should think about and we we wanted young people to know that uh farming is much like life and pretty much in order to be successful you need to know what you want to grow you need to uh make a plan for profit um a lot of people think that uh farming is just some like old timey thing but it's really at the front age uh it's at the forefront of today's trends so um food security is a big thing globally locally and um, we encourage young people to to grow but pretty much it takes planning it takes time and investment um there's many aspects you can do like agriculture you can do horticulture which is pretty much like gardening flowers for home growers uh, if you if you ever want to get into agriculture, uh, it takes time to build a foundation of a farm and uh, everything might not always go as you plan, but farming teaches you to adapt. So that's what we wanted people to know. And um, we believe that young people should try, should aspire for agriculture and to be farmers because we need more growers. We need more young people and young people are the future. So we need you guys to get out there, put your hands in the dirt and uh, see where you fit in, in the food chain, literally, and um, help us to s help solve some of the world's issues in relationship to food security, both abroad and here in our country um, so that we can have a more sustainable uh, world and everybody could be left um, full and not hungry. Right, and Kip and I didn't have a farming background I studied environmental science and he studied uh, sociology. And together we, um, it was really our care for the earth that brought us together. And we realized that we can do what we love and also try to make a living from it. So that was one of the core reasons why we got into agriculture. I love being outside. I love just the different ecosystems and I just love to grow food. So we really want to share our journey. This is still the beginning for us. We have so much to learn and we are just grateful to share what we know with you all. Yeah, and we see a question that says, uh, what would be your advice for young people who want to start farming what would be the first step and my advice is one to start doing research everyone's in their phones nowadays everyone has access to the internet get on some youtube and start asking youtube the G youtube genie and start asking all of these questions about maybe the favorite plants that you're interested in 
Uh, at the same time, get out and find your uh, local farmer's market and talk to some growers. And the last thing is uh, get into community gardening. Find if there's any community gardens in your area, that's how we started. So we encourage y'all to like build a network. If there's no community gardens in your city, you may want to consider starting one, but that's kind of like the launch pad for people to test out their research and to see what they know is by joining the community garden and seeing if it's something that you really want to do. Um, do Thank you, you guys. Yeah, there's a couple more questions in there, but um, uh, we're, we're got about a minute and a half left. So do you have other farm workers, employees, or are you the main farmers, growers on your um, farm? And then what kind of crops do you sell? Right, so uh, we are the main growers on our farm. We have volunteers that come out and help us, but we don't have employees yet. This year, we're looking to get our first uh, interns. And next year, we're looking to begin um, like the employment process of hiring people to help us out. And in terms of the crops that we grow, we mainly grow annual seasonal vegetables um, like collards, uh, tomatoes, peppers, onions, celery, and uh, cucumbers and stuff, but we also are looking towards expanding and growing more perennial fruits like uh, persimmons. Um, we also want to grow uh, turmeric and uh, other things like that. Awesome, and we'll we'll make this the last one since we're coming up on time. But was it easy to build your customer base at the farmers market? Um, it it was relatively easy. The farmers market is a market, so it's made to attract people. You put yourself in that place. And at first, uh, oftentimes, especially being in the neighborhood that we're in, a lot of people weren't used to some of the crops that we were bringing. But um, over time, you develop a relationship and it just gain, it just strengthens over time. So if you're consistent, it's pretty easy to uh, build our, a customer base at a farmer's market. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. You definitely sound like you have a really cool op uh, operation and we really appreciate you guys being here. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so let's go ahead and move to our next speaker, Lowell with True Leaf. Hey, everybody. I wanted to say thanks a lot for participating and giving me some time on this. Um, can y'all hear me? Because I can't hear anybody. Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Okay, good. Just had to make sure. I've been in a lot of those calls where I was talked for a few minutes before anyone said anything. So I wanted to talk to you guys today about my role in uh, legal and licensed medical cannabis in the good state of Florida. So first off, my name is Lowell Collins. My current job title is process engineer. My education background is in economics is my BS and biochemistry is my uh, MS. And so uh, I got into medical cannabis after I spent time as an analytical microbiologist for the city of Tallahassee. Um, the jobs that I have had uh, in Truly are numerous at this time. We're growing so quickly that there's a lot of opportunities to move around throughout departments. So I've worn many hats. So I'll just kind of take you briefly through my history of working in the field. I began as the assistant master grower. Um, my responsibilities included tending the facilities uh, in uh, in every aspect from employee mentorship to education, uh, process development, plant care, research and development. Uh, then I moved on to a plant health manager of one of our facilities. So I was given my own facility to develop as I chose. Um, after doing so, uh, I became the site administrator. So I dealt with the employee facing side of the business and budgeting. Um, and I went from that role into my current role of process engineer, where I do uh, efficiency and effectiveness studies on all of our grow, processing, and logistics operations. And I'll be moving into a new title, quality engineer, where I diagnose um, any uh, issues we have, consistent issues we have with our uh, product lines from the grow all the way through the point of sale there. You, thanks for speaking up in the chat. Now you can see me. Um, great. So uh, I'll pay a little bit more attention to the chat if you all have any questions throughout. So if we move to the next slide.
So what I want to discuss here is just the opportunities in medical cannabis. And I'll leave the slide up because I don't want to just read off the slide. But there's an additional piece of information I have kind of off to the side. And that's just the number of companies operating only in Florida and the number of uh, just the volume of those operations. And I'll, I'm just going to go through that really quickly um, before I get into sort of the structure function of how this is working in the state of Florida. So right now there are um, 23 current licenses. So that's only 23 um, MMTC licenses available on, or active currently in the state. And of those 23, only 13 of them are currently producing. So some people hold these licenses and they don't actually operate and, and produce. They're either waiting to develop or they're waiting to sell those licenses. And some of them are active producers. But like I said, out of the 23, there are only 13 actively producing. True Leave is the largest of those producers. So just a quick breakdown of how does this working in the state of Florida? What, how, you know, what legal mechanisms have allowed this? So well, the way the state of Florida is set up currently is that we have a vertically integrated market. So the vertically integrated market means that the company has to own every aspect of its production. So the company owns what's called seed to sale. So the very um, initial development of the plant, by the way, no, there are no free seeds, um, the, all the way through the point of sale and every process therein. So unlike other markets, uh, there are, uh, the companies are allowed to maybe own just the grow or just the retail or just the processing. Here in the state of Florida, you have to be completely and wholly owned uh, throughout your entire process. So that means truly is responsible for control Bold substance from its inception as a seed all the way through the point of sale, which makes it a highly regulated environment. Every facility is a secure facility with badged access, uh, top notch security, um, and controls all throughout the processes to, to account for any loss of, you know, what is still a federally scheduled one uh, uh, compound, which means that it, it is the most tightly regulated compound short of, say, weapons grade plutonium. Um, and so while we're working with this, you know, the care for the product is the same you'll find in any pharmaceutical situation because this is medically valuable um, material. And so one of the things that I am, have been working on and will continue to work on in the near future with Truly is how can we increase the, um, the effectiveness of every process uh, so that we're getting the most through because we have such high standards. One of the issues we find is that we're not everything that could be, that could make it to the market is making it to the market because we want to absolutely hold it to these super, super, super tough standards. And what that's doing is kind of choking out the market. So the market is estimated at somewhere in the neighborhood of eight and a half billion dollars. Um, and so we're going to see a lot more market maturity in the next five to 10 years because there's no way any single company is going to be able to take up that entire chunk of eight and a half billion dollars. So when we move into the part of this discussion where we talk about jobs, uh, you know, this is some of this is at the national level. Um, so, you know, when I say that there are 250,000 roughly full time jobs uh, as of January 2020, that was a year ago, obviously. Um, and since then, we've seen more states not only open up to medical cannabis, but go from medical cannabis to adult use recreational, which, in fact, offers more jobs. And so just within the state of Florida, as we see this medical market mature and develop and more producers enter the market and companies like Truly continue to expand, you know, we're going to see these these jobs develop, especially in a state uh, like Florida that's so agriculturally intensive and deviating a little bit away from, you know, high THC medical cannabis. The development of the hemp market is uh, also going to support a lot of agricultural jobs. Previous to the mid 1950s, the United States used hemp products, um, you know, T-shirts, plastics 
all kinds of fuels and materials were produced from hemp. Well, now that market is opening back up. It's in its very, very infancy right now. But as you, as you all come into the job market and as that job market develops further, there will be growing hemp just like there's growing cotton and corn for commodities. You know, we'll be growing hemp for, you know, uh, thread, hemp for plastics, hemp for fuels, hemp for food, proteins. None of those are going to be in the tightly regulated uh, THC medical cannabis wedge. There will be a separate developing in industry within the ag sector. And so that's an additional uh, sort of boom of jobs that you're not seeing in this display here. What we're talking about on this slide is strictly jobs to do with medical cannabis. Um, and so as more states sort of open up their uh, legality and, and options for this, we're going to see more jobs. But strictly within the state of Florida, you know, we're, we're currently only, like I had mentioned before, uh, just over half of the licensed companies are even growing. So once those are all fully growing, you know, we're going to see literally a doubling of the jobs available in the state of Florida, of which there are already um, many, many employers that so truly is looking at having 100 dispensaries at the end of this year, 200 by the end of 2022, 2023. And so just the retail staff alone is estimated to be around three to 4,000 employees. Uh, and so that's coming in, you know, at a late stage development in this industry and still finding great upward mobility, you know, great paying jobs that are within the agricultural sector. And the, the, the more that we follow this down its natural progression as we develop into further and further refined pharmaceutical products from cannabis and further, further refined materials and fuels from hemp and other cannabis uh, plants, you know, more high tech, high paying jobs are gonna be coming out of this. This, this isn't, you know, field cropping uh, this is all highly regulated and highly technical indoor growing where uh, more and more you'll find people developing these really interesting apps, really interesting robotics around these uh, indoor fields, basically. So um, I can't discuss the, the parameters of the, of the grow or the scenarios I've worked in, but I can tell you, you know, environments almost as large as production agricultural environments are being developed uh, strictly for medical cannabis and hemp in the near future. So you're going to see a similar scaling of uh, agricultural, you know, mechatronics and mechanical integration and labor integration. You know, I have a, you know, a, a mostly science background, but I'm also a, a PhD uh, dropout in engineering. So uh, a lot of what we do here is is tickling all of those interests. You know, I, I didn't have to be a professional engineer to become a process engineer because the, the field is developing so rapidly, it's almost uh, less of an advantage to have experience. It's almost better to come in with an open mind and be able to apply your curiosity to what's going on and how this is developing. Okay, uh, so I uh, don't want to cut you off there, but for the sake of time, um, yep. we're going to hold your questions because you're staying after, correct, Will? That's correct. Okay, so we'll go ahead and pause you there, and then we'll, we're going to move on to our next speaker, and we'll hold your questions for after Melanie is finished. So um, thank you all, and we'll move on to Melanie, um, and she is with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Science. Thank you, everyone. Um, just to let you know, I'm unable to start my video because the host has stopped it. Um, my name is Melanie Mason and I do work for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I'm going to start my video for everyone now. There we go. Um, it has been so interesting to hear from all of you. Um, I will be going on even sort of a different path. Um, I've worked a lot in food recovery. And that has entailed working mostly with schools and farms, uh, educating people about the benefits of, um, food, of food recovery. So in the case of farms, I spend a lot of time promoting gleaning. We have a lot of gleaning organizations in Florida, although they are mostly run by volunteers. Uh, there are leaders within those uh, organizations and that is their profession. 
Uh, they run these gleaning agencies. Uh, some of the largest ones we have in the state are Society of St. Andrew. Uh, we have Transition Sarasota and we have Cross Ministries and we have Destin Harvest. Um, and so that's been really exciting. Uh, we have recovered over 5 million pounds about a year uh, through gleaning operations. Additionally, uh, farmers will get um, a tax deduction for their donation. And one of the first questions I usually get is about the legality of it all. And it is absolutely legal to donate wholesome food. It is encouraged by the USDA, the EPA, the Florida Dev Department of Environmental Protection, the Florida Department of Agriculture, we want you to donate. And so many people are concerned um, that there are civil and criminal liability concerns with donating food. No one in the history of the United States has ever been penalized for donating wholesome food. It is a myth. I don't know where it came from. I don't know why everyone clings to it, but schools can donate produce from their gardens if they're not gonna consume it all. And they can give it to their local food banks and their local food pantries. And on my website, I actually have sample agreements that people can use. So I spend a lot of time myth busting and explaining to schools and farms all the power they actually hold in their hands to uh, engage in food recovery. So um, that does um, create a lot of uh, interesting nooks in the job market. Uh, a lot of people have been creating apps uh, to help uh, food, find, food find home and bridge the gap. Um, so that's been very interesting. In fact, uh, some of you may or may not know we are in the midst of Florida Food Waste Prevention Week. And this morning we had a presentation from three different groups of high school and university students who had all developed unique business idea solutions for reducing food waste. One of them involved making uh, fresh dog food. Another one was a really interesting um, phone app idea. And then another one even involved uh, installing solar panels in schools to reduce the cost. Schools have to incur to pay energy so they can spend more money on putting in food saving measures and more refrigerators into schools and things like that. So there's so many areas within the world of food recovery that have yet to be looked at and discovered mostly because people are afraid and they think it's not allowed, but it is. Um, so that's just a little bit about food recovery. Uh, as far as my background, um, I uh, studied economics at Florida State University, also a seminal. Uh, I did that because it sounded smart and I didn't know what I was doing. So then I worked at a plant nursery, I worked at Tallahassee Nurseries for about eight years. And then I abandoned it all and I joined the Peace Corps and I served in Paraguay for three and a half years as an agriculture volunteer. And I learned so much about agriculture in Paraguay and working with the Paraguayans. Uh, it was just incredible. And so then I went and got my master's degree in agricultural development. And I do have a small farm and I have found that being familiar with food recovery and how to use any excess food can be helpful to a small farming business as well, because you can deduct up to 15% of your annual income, your gross in annual income on food donations. So that can be something that's really helpful for businesses to know. Um, I don't have quite as much to say as everyone else, but I did really enjoy uh, what everyone said and I enjoyed listening to everyone. Um, do we uh, want to move on to questions or uh, is there anything else specific that you'd like me to speak about while I'm here? Sure, we can go ahead and move on. Um, Tiffany, do you want to move on to the ending Q&A or I'm going to go ahead and let you pick that up, Tiffany? Sure, we'll just go ahead and wrap up since Melanie is able to stay as well as Tori and Lowell. Uh, we want to make sure that you know those of you that have to hop off um, can. So. You're welcome to stay and chat with those three presenters as well. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and give you the links to if you want to um, give us some feedback on this session, how we did. It's just a quick five minute survey. And we also have our PD survey if you need that. And please join our Facebook group if you have not already. And then there's the link to the Google Drive folder as well. 
So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the presenters for being here. We're really happy that you have been. And our next session will be on Tuesday, April 6th from 3.30 to 4.30. And that will be on navigating fertilizers. So everyone can go ahead and we're gonna move into more questions and answers for Melanie and if you have anything for Lowell as well and Tori.